we meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. If this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. So we are here today on Energy Impact with Michael Liebrich, the chairman and CEO of Liebrich Associates, but more famously known for his uh, startup. I don't know if it was just called New Energy Finance at the time or more commonly now known as Bloomberg New Energy Finance, um, but you are an absolute legend in the space of energy information technology and now clean energy more broadly. Michael, we are so excited to have you on the show. Welcome to Energy Impact. Brett, you're too kind. Yes, that's right. Uh, amazingly. Uh, just under 20 years ago, I did uh, sit in my front room and decide to pull the trigger and found uh, New Energy Finance, which is now, of course, Bloomberg NEF. Well, before we get there, I want to hear about you as an individual. Where did you grow up and how did you get into the sector to begin with? So I am uh, born in London in a place called Northolt, uh, so West London, just you know, not, not very central. Uh, but then I grew up in West London. I'm actually West London through and through. If you know London well, you'll realize that West Londoners, you know, are very different from North Londoners or South Londoners. And in fact, I've probably been in, in New York more often than I've been in, uh, you know, some of those places. But I'm very much a Londoner through and through. And um, uh, so I grew up, I uh, went to school in London. I uh, had the great um, uh, privilege and honor of being pushed incredibly hard by my parents. So despite modest means, went to a very, very good school. Um, and then on to Cambridge. So I did um, engineering, and in retrospect, it was energy engineering. And it wasn't called that because Cambridge being what it is, it was just called, it was a Bachelor of Arts in engineering. That's Cambridge for you. Um, but it was energy engineering. So I did uh, thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, mechanics, and nuclear. I then went off and did uh, two things, a lot of business and consulting, and also a lot of skiing. And, you know, funnily enough, when I, when I, and I was a lost soul career wise and personally in many ways until I started new energy finance and suddenly it was like, oh, well, I know why I did that. I know why I studied energy engineering because now I'm doing this and well, I know why I skied and climbed because now I'm doing this. And I know well, why I, was I did about business. to say, you skipped no. over the skiing a little bit. You weren't just a, a casual skier. No, I got rather, I, I, I guess it's sort of, you know, I, I guess it's my personality. You know, I do have an obsessive compulsive side to me. So, you know, when I liked skiing, I really liked skiing. And so I was, I was the kid that was up there for the, you know, when the lifts opened and uh, made sure that when they shut, he was still at the top of the mountain. So he's got the longest run down. And, uh, and I did that pretty intensively. Uh, I ended up being pretty good at skiing got in uh, through a very convoluted routes, long story, ended up um, at the Olympics in 1992 in Albertville. That's amazing. Yeah, I feel like you and I are a little bit kindred spirits that way. I actually have to be careful with my hobbies. I have to like watch myself to make sure I beca don't become too obsessed with them and like, like remind myself they're just a hobby, just a hobby, Brett. Yes, I mean, I don't really have hobbies anymore um, because for exactly that reason. So my hobby is, in a sense, now, you know, the clean energy and transport transition and all of this stuff. So, you know, I can kind of spend all day on Twitter reading amazing things and getting into getting into fights and call it work when obviously it's not work. It's also it's also <laughs> intensely enjoyable. OK, so tell me about uh, new energy finance. Where were you working at the time when you decided to kind of pioneer your own thing? Well, so 2003, um, which was when I was sort of doing the, the prep work and, and uh, diving deep into energy technologies, um, the reason I was doing that is that I was actually washed high and dry by the whole TMT uh, dot com boom bust cycle. Mm. Um, so I was actually unemployed and unemployable. And it's a funny thing because I met 
um, the former head of the McKinsey London office, uh, a few years later, 2007, I was at the Clinton Global Initiative and I, and I met him um, and said, uh, and he said, oh, Michael, you're doing so well. I see you all over the place. You always were such an entrepreneur. And I said to him, actually, that's not strictly true. I was washed high and dry and I could not get a job, which is why I started New Energy Finance. And he said, oh, don't be ridiculous. Nobody with your background, you know, Cambridge engineer with first class, this, that and the other, you know, Harvard Business School, Baker Scholar, Olympics, you know, McKinsey. Nobody is ever unemployed with that background. And I said, you know what? Walk a mile in my shoes before you say that. Uh, it, the the dot com boom bust and that 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 cycle was deeply traumatic, and it left me with you know my entire Rolodex was wiped out. Every everything I'd worked on, everybody I'd worked with, got flushed you know down the tubes, and uh, and and you know initially I was all sort of you know pretty pretty sparky. I said, well, I'll travel a bit, I'll hang out. You know, it's been pretty intense as well, um, but. You know, uh, by 2003, I'm just doing the maths in my head. You know, I'm I'm 40 years old. I have no money built up. You know, I've, I basically at one point in the dot com boom bust, I was on paper worth you know 30 million dollars, which was ridiculous. I knew, but I thought I'd get some out. I thought I'd get like 10 percent out and have at least some money to be able to you know uh, rent a place, start a business, do something. You know, start a family. You know. And, and I ended up getting 1% out. I got literally washed up at the end of that with $300,000, you know, a couple of hundred thousand pounds. And I just was watching it disappear. So I did the obvious thing, um, which was start a company. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I feel like that's also the classic like Silicon Valley story. I mean, I, I my formative years, my 20s, I was, I was out there and everyone I knew was a paper millionaire, you know, and, and going through very similar experiences. Yeah. And it was, and it was very traumatic. You know, I don't, I don't expect any, um, you know, no violins because I've, you know, it has all turned out so incredibly well, you know, uh, from the founding of new energy finance uh, you know, I, I find myself now in this, you know, really privileged place, you know, both in the sense that I've had a successful, um, you know, business build successful exit, you know, I now own a lovely place, you know, here in London, big house. I've also got a, a ski chalet. Uh, we're going to have to talk about my flower meadow, which I've just bought. I'm, okay. I'm doing some rewilding. Uh, that's okay. the newest project, newest obsessive compulsive hobby. Um, <laughs> and, and, I've, and more importantly, I, I, met my, I met my wife through New Energy Finance. I've got three beautiful kids through New Energy Finance. So no violins, no sympathy. But 2001 to three, that's I was... Awesome. I was really, yeah. I was, I was, I was, you know, deeply in trouble, you know, in terms of my career, but also psychologically, you know, really, really um, uh, had lost a lot of self-confidence. Yeah. Questioning uh, self-worth. Yeah, absolutely. Now, okay. So what was the inspiration? What was the insight that you had captured that led to any app? You know, it really was a sector and a thesis that, that kind of chose me, you know, Steve jobs does this thing, you know, and he, he the, the speech he gave at the graduation, I can't remember where it is. It's a Stanford, famous Stanford speech. graduation. Yeah. And, and he talks about joining the dots in retrospect. You can only see the sense backwards. And that truly was, you know, I, I started, you know, explaining it as why did I, why was I an obsessive skier and then a climber? Well, guess what? Because then I can see the impacts of our modern lifestyle. You know, you only have to go up to a glacier and you can see what's happening. Right. And, yeah, and you, or you look, down into the valleys and you can see the brown smogs right but i was also um an energy engineer with a good grasp of the feasible you know i'm not i'm not going to fall for anybody who's got a perpetual motion machine right or, right, right. Kind of, you have a you, know, you have a physical intuition of these systems yeah i think that's a fair that yes i do feel i do i think i think that you know my track record uh, as a as a commentator as an analyst you would suggest that's right so you know i can think through and it, by the way it's not just the the thermodynamics uh it's actually also a lot of it is the microeconomics what is going to cost less yeah, yeah. later in you know one how 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 much of a friend is the experience curve going to be for let's say um a fuel cell car versus a battery car right you know, so, and those so sorts of things so i got that systems, and then the finance so you, you can know, look so at I, these systems and say okay what component of it is labor versus materials moving forward in the future if we make certain assumptions about technology or manufacturing scale up 
you know, which, which slice of the pie will decrease and, and, and be able to project that forward to really do kind of a holistic assessment of an energy technology potential. Yeah, I think I think that's right. And, you know, I grew up another very important piece of my my early background is that my dad was a mechanic. Um, my mom was a nurse. My dad was a mechanic. And my uh, early years, we were, you know, we were constantly having to drop the engine out of my mom's Morris Minor 1000 and change the clutch and do all that kind of stuff. So yeah. I grew up with a very uh, physical appreciation of yeah. um, machinery mechanics. And then again, very lucky and one of those other dots one of those other steve job dots that i join up backwards in my first job um uh when i wasn't being a ski bum uh my first proper job as a management consultant was with a company called braxton associates later part of deloitte and touche and we were calculating learning curves and i just spent a lot of time doing learning rates for most ridiculous things including you know rock quarrying and cheese manufacturing and all sorts of stuff and every sector has learning curves. And, and so, you know, you get this, you get this sort of, you know, um, faith in innovation and in uh, the, the, in, the, the innovation delivered by engineers. I, it, it just works. You see it time and time again. And then so when people say things like, oh, well, the cost of solar has got to stop going down at some point. And you're like, well, why? It's just sand. You know, it's sand that becomes silicon and different sand that becomes glass. And yeah, you've got some steel, you've got some metal bashing on the racks, but what, there's nothing in there that says that it can't continue to go down essentially forever. But of course, slower and slower because these things yeah. are log log curves and so on. But you know, so there's just a few things in my background that I think gave me a little bit of a different perspective. And the other thing was we haven't talked about yet is finance. Yep. I did. Um, I did a lot of finance at business school. I've done I've I've done my time as a junior analyst building you know cash flow modeling, uh, doing cash flow models, um, and then I'd been in uh, venture. So I'm I'm a very numerical finance type person, and I think a lot of people, very few people would have the exact set of backgrounds. It's sort of the 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 thermodynamics plus the mechanical engineering plus the appreciation of the uh, environmental constraints yeah. um, plus the finance and and you know the capital markets even uh, you know when I was working on for instance sustainable energy for all this is an initiative set up by uh, Ban Ki Moon the Secretary General at the time of the um, of the UN um, and uh, I was introduced by Kande Yumkeller who Ban Ki Moon had asked to set up this energy initiative for the UN. And I was introduced at this huge conference. And this is Michael. And he knows where all the money is to finance all of this because he knows all the venture capitalists. It's like, well, no, it's not venture capital. There's venture capital. There's private equity. There's uh, construction equity. finance. Yeah, there's yeah. project finance. There's, you know, there's the public markets. There's, there's primaries. There's secondaries. There's, there's the debt markets, debt markets, and then more debt markets. Yeah. And understanding how you put that... Um, how you put all those pieces together, because by the way, you know, on all of this transition, it's really important. The, the cost of capital is absolutely critical, right? Uh, because clean technologies, by definition, you're not buying fuel every day. Right. If you were buying fuel, you'd still be chucking the CO2 in the air. So you're right. not buying fuel. You're right. You're all weighted towards are... upfront costs. And that's why the cost of capital is so important. Right, exactly. So like for like, you know, you could have a fossil fueled, uh, you know, uh, technology with a levelized cost and a clean energy technology with the same levelized cost, the, but one will be enormously more, the clean one will be enormously more uh, upfront to the, uh, capital the expenditure. Capital, yeah. And and so now that's really important, by the way, when you look at the current um, uh, sort of energy crunch and what it might be doing to inflation and what that might ultimately do to interest rates. That's yeah. actually pretty scary stuff. Wait, can you but, actually, you know, I, can you spell that out a little bit? And I want to, I do want to get back to your story, but I think you're on a really interesting point. Give me a little bit of prediction here. What happens to, if inflation goes one way or another, how does that affect the cost of capital slash the ability to invest in energy infrastructure? Right. So another of the dots that I join up backwards in my career is that I'm, I'm old enough to have started my career just at the back end of when inflation was a thing. So in my like first job, yeah. you know, when, I, when I started in exactly in 1986, uh, 86, 87, 88, any time you drew a chart, a time series in dollars or pounds or, or euros didn't exist then, but Deutschmarks or, or whatever it was, 
you had to deflate. You had to use in, you know, you had to adjust for inflation because inflation uh, in the UK, it peaked at 26 percent. In the US, it peaked at 15 percent in the 80s, in 70s uh, 70s and uh, I think late 70s, beginning of the 80s, respectively. And you, if you didn't adjust for that, you didn't get any sense of whether something was growing or not because it was just distorted by inflation. Um, so I started my career when inflation was a thing. Now, for most the, the last 14 years, 11 of them, the federal funds rate has been 0.25%. And inflation has been you know 2% or less. I mean, it occasionally kind of goes up to 3%, but it comes back down fairly quickly. And we are right now inflation in UK uh, euros, dollars, so UK GB pounds, uh, euros and uh, dollars is around 4%. And it's still going up, right? It's, it's clear that the energy price hikes that we're seeing are going to feed through into the economy. And you've got two other inflationary pressures going on right now. Um, one is uh, if we've got tensions with China, uh, that's going to be inflationary because one of the things we've been doing for the last 20, 25, 30 years is um, just offshoring more and more to Asia. So that's been an enormous deflator because the costs of, you know, we, we've been bringing in, uh, you know, these, these cheap goods, cheap commodities and so on. And that has kept prices, it's kept a lid on prices. Now, if you unwind that, if you want to have a trade war with China, you better expect some inflation in your own economy because you're now saying, oh, well, those sneakers, we're going to have to pay more for because we're going to try and we have to get them somewhere else, probably more expensive. And the other thing is expectations. Once everybody thinks, you know, whoa, uh, you know, inflation, yeah. uh, I, I'm going to ask the boss for a raise because, you know, my, I'm just getting I'm getting hit by, a, a, you know, horrendous energy bills. Those sneakers became more expensive. Yeah, the psychological so, aspect of inflation. Yeah, yeah. There's a. There's a flywheel there. Yeah, so once yeah. you get those expectations. Now, what does that mean? Two by two matrix, right? I was at McKinsey. I can do two by two matrices here. Um, you know, inflation and interest rates. You know, we've yeah. been in the low, low, you know, low inflation, low interest rates. We haven't had to think about it. Yeah. Um, we are now moving into an inflationary period. It could be a year. It could be two years. Could be, a, you know, could be longer because of those expectations, that flywheel. But also, we don't know what's going to happen to interest rates. We don't know what our policymakers will do. They may say, well, you know, a bit of inflation, uh, but let the economy run because we're coming out of this pandemic. And, you know, hopefully we won't have to get to the kind of Paul Volcker moment where we really see, boom, high interest rates. Right. right. So like, we, isn't we don't it, know isn't exactly where we're going to be on the rest of that matrix. Yeah, isn't it good for energy infrastructure projects, clean energy infrastructure projects, if um, interest rates are low and inflation actually goes high, because now you borrow the money and then you don't have to pay back as much in theory. Is that the idea? Let's put it this way. Um, if we've got any listeners to this who have got a bunch of projects that they financed, uh, you know, then they need to think that through because if they have, uh, you know, index linked, there, the, right? The you got to index link yeah, your revenue. You got to index link right. your revenue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but if you've not index linked your revenue, you may Fuck. find it hard to pass on the price increases. Yeah, yeah. And I would suggest that anybody who's got those projects should be running those scenarios right now, because if not, their bankers are going to be doing it for them, yeah, yeah, and it might be a very yeah. unpleasant process. Yeah. I mean, that's a, and that's the worry. We yeah. what we might see. Yes, you know the 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 the, the worrying scenario is where the central banks have to actually put the brakes on because it because of inflation and they have to you know we, we if we end up in a situation where those base rates have to go up two three four percent and then you see the inflation come down to you know back to a couple of percent but for a while you'll have a real interest rate that is higher than normal higher than we've had for the last few years so yeah it's anyway you know we, we'll get into we'll get into the weeds but the point is that i think to to really do um to to really do the job of a commentator or an analyst in this space, it's kind of helpful to have, okay, we just talked about a bit of macro as well as the finance, as well as the engineering, as well as the environmental stuff uh, and, and so on. And I'll be honest, to a certain extent, you've also got to have the, the, the social awareness um, to understand where people are coming from in terms of, um, you know, right now here in London, we've got people kind of gluing themselves to roads uh, because, and it's called Insulate Britain, which is, um, 
and, and you've got to understand where people are coming from in terms of their desire for either social change, you know, just transition. Um, you know, the, the Green Deal is not just about energy and engineering and finance, right? There's something yeah. much, much deeper from a societal perspective. Yeah, yeah. From the average public person, you know, it's perspective. It's yeah, it, it's actually more to do with those other social issues sometimes than it is the actual energy or, or climate considerations. Well, and for sure, and certainly, you know, certainly, energy is so complicated that it gets incredibly tribal. You know, you yeah, yeah. you can believe that. Yeah, you can always come up with a set of facts that support what you want because it's too yeah. complex to 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 give it an honest appraisal. Right. And so, you know, you could say, you know, nuclear is the only answer because and you can, you know, you, you can be, I don't know, you know, Michael Schellenberger and create a sort of a tissue of facts to support that. And you can create another tissue of facts that say, no, no, it's only renewables. You could be Mark Jacobson and have another tissue. Uh, and then you could have a, a whole other tissue that says that only fossil fuels um, create uh, wealth and pull people out of poverty. And there's I can't remember his name. There's that philosopher who who. Uh, um, the, the moral case for fossil fuels, who he has another tissue. And I try to avoid, I mean, I use, I use, you know, I, I use tissues to blow my nose in. I try and be <laughs> you know, 360, uh, you know, and try to be honest in all directions. It doesn't always work, but that's, yeah. that's my goal in life is to have some kind of intellectual integrity and not just create these tissues. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Hold on. We got to get back to your story. We can't, Cause I don't want to miss it. What was the product, uh, NEF, the, what was the product? And then walk us through the point that it was, you know, or at least tell us how it was sold and, and, and why it was sold. Oh, so when I started, um, and I, I started researching it and, and getting into the topic area in a, in a deep way in 2003, and really the, the driver there was everything I had been working on had blown up. Everybody that I, you know, I couldn't draw on anybody for, um, you know, networking because you know, they'd all lost their jobs as well. And, um, and I'm not very good at networking from a point of weakness. You know, if I don't know what I want and I don't have anything to offer it, I like trading, but I'm not, you know, asking for help. I'm very bad at asking for help. Um, so, but what was, what was happening was um, everything I saw seemed to have something to do with energy and with some kind of a, of a, of a, a, a secular, a, a really kind of long-term shift. So you saw things like, um, discussion at the time, everybody was very excited about peak oil and depletion. Um, there was the IPCC's third assessment report at the time, came out in 2001, but it took me a couple of years to kind of find it. And then I was really diving deep on climate change because it kind of resonates. I'm naturally, a, I'm a conservative and I'm not, not somebody who naturally sees, you know, um, uh, boogeymen around every corner, but it did, I could see that the glaciers and the weather seem to be changing. And so I got deep into that. Uh, and that's, you know, very clearly related to energy. And then there was the second Gulf War, which is clearly an energy war. I mean, we would not have, you know, yeah. we would not be in there had uh, Iraq not, you know, had oil. That's absolutely clear. Um, but there were a lot of things uh, going on. Even I was I went climbing in uh, Bolivia and the army and the police had had an actual shooting confrontation because there were sort of riots and protests about whether um, whether uh, Bolivia should sell its natural gas to the damn Yankee, to, to North America. Wow. And, um, and then I flew back through Brazil and there were brownouts because the Brazilian economy at the time under, I think it was under President Lula, um, was um, uh, growing so fast they couldn't meet the energy demand. And while I was there, there was this power cut, this huge, the Northeast power cut in the U.S., and then there was the uh, the big power cut in Europe, and these are to do with aging infrastructure and, and uh, failure like to invest. When you say power cut, you mean blackout or blackouts? Yes, yeah, okay. yes. Um, so um, you know, and they wrote, and they and they kind of they cascaded through the systems and uh, and so on. So everything seemed. So on the one hand, you had all these problems, but then as a technologist, I and there's somebody who understood learning curves. I was looking at going, well, hang on a second. There's like, there's wind and there's solar and there's, there's biomass. I knew nothing about, uh, uh, about any of that, but it did strike me that that would yield to, you know, uh, solar is material science. It's flat screen TVs, the same technology. Why would it not yield to improvements? And um, so I started to, I actually, and the other thing is people were talking about the hydrogen revolution at the time. Still uh, talking about it. They were talking about it. And, and it took, and I sort of, I thought, okay, I'll go. I went back up to Cambridge and talked to some of my old profs and, and uh, to see whether there was anything in it and decided that it was going to be 
uh, quite quickly decided it, it, that there may be something, but it would take decades, yeah, yeah. Um, which is broadly speaking where I, where I am still um, to a certain extent. No, it seems more concrete this time around. But, um, but what I became persuaded, well, and then what was interesting, I didn't know what business model, it was just, this just became this kind of itch that I needed to scratch to find out more and more and more. And very quickly, I realized that I knew such a small amount and yet more than most of the people I was talking to, certainly in the business community. <laughs> and so I had friends who are, uh, you know, permission arbitrage time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And they, and they were you know, I investment banker friends, people I'd been to business yeah, school yeah. with, and they were energy investment bankers. Yeah. And you would say, so, um, you know, which, uh, which clean energy companies are you covering through your equity research? And they'd be like, what do you mean by clean energy companies? I'm like, <laughs> oh, you know, people like Vestas in, in Denmark, you know, oh, Vestas, how do you spell that? You know, and I thought, okay. And, and, you know, the motto of new energy finance in the early days was in the land of the blind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because wow, we were just wow. the one-eyed, we were the one-eyed man or the one-eyed wow. man and yeah. women. And, you know, we just, we, we were always trying to stay so, so what did you six do? months ahead. Yeah, so you just compiled reports or what was- Well, not, not reports. So we started, I'm very, you know, very left-brained in, I love data. So what I did actually, even going back to um, late 2003, beginning of 2004, I was um, putting um, as every deal in hydrogen and fuel cells, I was trying to record it. And, you know, so you, you, there was a, a lot of venture capital activity even back then. There was the sort of, it was the yeah. first, it, well, it was, I guess it was the kind of tail end of the hydrogen, you know, bubble and, of, and of the year How did you collect this data though? Where did you get oh. this from? Well, so we we would I was just you know Google had luckily you know happened just and like so, SEC you know, filings and that type of stuff everything or? anything just you know go, go, googling around reading the news yeah. and it was the, the there was a lot of news flow and there was actually there was um uh, a publication I'm going to try and uh, you know Fuel Cell Weekly or something like that Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Weekly which I think is still around Johnson Matthey had had sponsored it and uh, so there was lots of news flow but it was you know if you looked into for instance um the the venture capital data sets venture source venture one those sorts of things but sure. now you would look at Crunchbase or, or whatever um but there uh, all of this stuff was you know um 10836 electrical equipment not elsewhere specified but they, they just look so a membrane for a fuel cell is so different from a fuel cell stack which is so different from a fuel cell car yeah. and yet it was all kind of lumped together so i very quickly got frustrated by just creating spreadsheets because one one um, investment in one company you might have three investors but those three investors might have three companies that they invested in and then you've got a law firm and you've got a banker and you've got some other thing so it clearly needed a relational database yeah. and i went on to i went on the internet there was a thing at the time called uh, rentacoder.com uh, now called freelancer.com and i um, I put up a, a sort of secret spec, got a few people that said they were interested, then gave them a bit more information uh, and ended up with a Polish programmer um, who asked really smart questions. And we built this beautiful relational database. We worked nights. He actually had, he had a day job. I hadn't met him. I didn't meet him for about a year. He was in Warsaw. I think he worked for Johnson and Johnson during the day and for me during the night. Uh, and I, you know, we, I paid him, you know, it was literally a few hundred pounds. It was yeah. very little. And then of course it all grew in complexity and we ended up working together for many years. Um, and we, but we, what we, we did something that was, you know, incredibly user-friendly because of the time I'd spent in the dot-com sectors, I understood user interfaces and how important. And so what we could do, we created a system that let's say you're talking about a, uh, a startup, you'd have a page that would describe the startup and at the bottom, you'd have these things we'd call slices and each slice, all the slices of who are its investors? What are the funding rounds that it's done? Who are its service providers in terms of, you know, bankers and whatever, you know, who'd worked on it. Now, if you clicked on a slice, that slice would open up, would become the page. And then it would say, okay, so now you've got, okay, that, that, that now we're, now we're looking at Kleiner Perkins, not the one of the portfolio companies gone from the portfolio company. You clicked on the slice for its investor, Kleiner Perkins. That was now up at the top. And underneath it, you'd have all the investments that it had made in the sector, all its portfolio companies and its team. So if you wanted to contact them, it was very easy. And I started, I started to show this to people. Actually, 
my co-founder and I were either going to start an information business or raise a fund. And this information was going to be our, which you've collected. Yeah. Right. We were going to use this information. You know, why would you be better as investors than anybody else? Well, look at the information, the information we've got. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. when people saw it, they're like, wow, holy moly, I want access to that. Yeah. yeah. I want to see that's what I want and to how use. Much do people pay? I need this. How much do people pay for it early days? So we started off um, trying to charge 3,000 pounds for three people to have access to this data. And very quickly, um, you know, we could talk about sort of startups and pivoting and being nimble. All these people who said, I need that, I need that, that's the tool I need. And I'd give them a password to go in and they wouldn't use it. And they, we can see from the server statistics, they wouldn't use it. And the reason is most people are too busy to go and mine data sets. That's just not what people do. And, and particularly you don't do it unless you know you're going to get the answer. The great thing about Google, when you search, you know you're going to get answers in, in, in an attempt of a second. Yeah. They might be right or not, but you know that there's going to be something. And so this thing, nobody, you can't see because the, the bulk of the data is, is below the waterline. Yeah. So we started a newsletter to highlight what it was that we were doing and also to gain um, a, 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 a kind of target set of um, you know, marketing you know, leads. So we started a newsletter then we started another newsletter, which was the two weekly. So we started a kind of news headlines first, and then we had the database. And then we had the, the deeper newsletter, which was the once every two weeks um, uh, called the briefing. And we were trying to charge the, the, the headlines were free. That was our freemium bit. The database was um, 3000 pounds for three seats. And the newsletter was a thousand pounds for a year. These were all annual. The newsletter was a thousand pounds. And, and we really, I mean, we struggled along doing that until uh, for the first, so we, we launched that in October, 2004. We launched it very quickly and we had the first revenue, but tiny, tiny revenues that first uh, by Christmas of the first year, which has been a target. 2005, we really struggled. And then 2006, we did two things, three things. We raised money. We brought in a little team on carbon analysis, carbon markets. And, uh, and then we also created a product, which was our insight product, which we could sell for 50,000 to half a million dollars. And that was the kind of, and, and uh, we, that, that was the product that made the company. Well, right? Because yeah, yeah. what insight are people willing to pay for? And how do they trust your insight? Like, well, I mean, these are all just such, you know, this is a long time ago. This is ancient history, but it's an interesting question, at least for me. Um, so what, what happens was that um, we actually hired a sales director. Uh, I had a sales director uh, and he couldn't sell anything and he, he was very disorganized. So I gave him an intern and the intern sold more than him. So we filed the sales director, kept the intern, but we brought in another sales director, um, a guy called Ken Bruder. Who was, and these are the things that make the company because he looked at it and he said, listen, you need to sell. You know, we, we will never get there selling at 3,000 pounds, you know, per team, you know, even if they're big teams and you can get 10,000 pounds. But you guys are getting really, really smart. We were bringing in interns to enter deals on, let's say, offshore wind or, or, or whatever it was. And we would get inquiries from the Wall Street Journal. You know, we need to talk to somebody about offshore wind. And I'd be like, well, talk to, you know, you know talk to Brett, he's great. And they wouldn't know that Brett was the intern. Yeah. And, they, and then, you know, the, the intern would be quoted in the Wall Street Journal saying very clever things. Yeah. And, you know, so we, and, and what, what Ken said was, you know, you, you guys, you may not realize it, what people pay for, they, they pay for insight, they pay for um, uh, trends, they pay for, understanding what the cost of solar will be in a year or in two years, because they're bidding on a project and they'll build it in two years. They, they want to know the forward price, yeah. right? They'll pay for understanding which bit of the supply chain has got a bottleneck, right? You know, there is not enough, you know, cable. I, I guess or, what, or I'm, what I'm wondering, did you come up with a standard set of in insights that then you would sell out or did people hire yeah. you almost as a consultant to say, no. give us an insight in this sector? No, they, they, they tried that and we tried to, and I, um, I, I, I sort of almost forbade the team from doing that because what happens is somebody says, we've decided 
to do, you know, to go into thin film solar in, you know, wherever you can then put all your resources into helping them, but you lose track of what else is happening around the, yeah. the, the, the world. We were doing subscription information services. Cool. So we are the, we are the, the, the everything source. And this was a, huge decision that we took in about 2005 you know as the whole sector started to go crazy it was like okay look do we just do a great job on wind and solar and i said no because you cannot be if anybody says i'm an expert on solar but i don't know anything about natural gas i don't know anything about nuclear and you don't, don't know, know how those two are going to intersect in no. the future and exactly one or the other you, yeah. You, yeah you become a sort of idiot savant yeah, because yeah, you're, yeah. Or, you know you, you you're incredibly smart but but functionally useless in real life yeah. uh, and so you know, we decided that we would do everything. And that ultimately that dragged us into smart meters, you know, into the, the smart uh, uh, grid. And it dragged us into power storage. It dragged us into fracking. It dragged, and, and you know, that's why we went from, um, you know, uh, 15 people at the end of 2015. And we went to 150 people at the end of 2018. Uh, sorry, sorry. 15 people at the end of 2005 Five, yeah. to 150 people at the end of 2008 when we started the sale process or the, yeah. or the beginning of 2009, because suddenly, you know, we had to keep adding people to remain smart about all of these different sectors. So no, yeah. we, we, which um, you more valuable to. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, but in terms of the consulting, so what we, what I set a rule for the team, and I said, we will do no more than 15% of revenue can come from events and no more than 15% from consulting. And we called consulting applied research because it sounded like it would have a better multiple at the exit. Yeah, yeah. You know, because it would, and we would only use, we only yeah, would do it. A product it gave you can us, sell many times instead of a one-off. Set, exactly. It gave us a rule of thumb because That's if it's applied research, it either uses our data sets or it causes us to do research, which adds to the data sets. Yeah. And that was the only time that we took those. Sorts. So we were selling subscription services overwhelmingly. But, you know, what, what, what I had thought was that you'd, sell, you'd have freemium and then you'd sell a newsletter and then you sell a database and then eventually you'd sell insight. And Ken was like, no, 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 no. Do you want to sell insight? Go sell insight. My team of salespeople are going to go sell the high value thing. But to your question, why do people trust your insight? Yeah. That's a really interesting one. So people wouldn't buy the data because they didn't have time to look at it. Yeah. But they would be really interested in the insight. And they would say, well, how do we know? You know, I've got all these people telling us how clever they are. I got McKinsey. I got everybody trying to sell whatever to me. How do I know that your, that your stuff is good? And we would say, well, have you seen our databases? And you'd show them the databases, how much data lay behind it. And they'd be like, whoa, okay. That's cool. You can put that away. I'll buy the insight service yeah. because it's a question of, it's almost like the peacock's tail, you know, the peacock, it's, it's it, you know, even if it's useless to that person, they're incredibly impressed by it. Yeah. And they would buy the insight service knowing that we had done our homework. So uh, I want to make sure that we've got time to focus on what you're doing now, but quickly tell us like, what was the acquisition process like? Did, did you go out to market? Did they approach you? Was it just a perfect fit? Well, so I had brought in external investors uh, in 2006, so relatively early on. So I knew I would have to create an exit for them. And I wanted an exit for myself, you know, through that process of being, you know, totally brutalized by the, you know, the, the TMT boom bust. I had no money. Uh, and I, this, this was very bad. I was in my 40s and I had no money. All my, all my friends who had been incredibly risk averse and boring coming out of business school um uh you know were, were were wealthy and and successful and i had so i always knew i was going to create an exit i knew i was going to sell and everybody in the company did everybody i mean even down to the interns had options the early interns maybe not the later ones but the early interns all had options some of them made you know tens and, and uh, tens of thousands or more uh, at the exit um so i i will say that I made lots and lots of mistakes building the business. There were lots of things that I did that I could have done better. I could have moved faster, recruitment, you know, failed recruitments and so on. But the exit, we really, really, you know, we, we nailed that. I had been flirting with a number of companies throughout um, and, you know, information providers that, I, that I, I thought would wake up to this mega trend and they would need an asset. And we were, you know, there was only us and another company called Point Carbon uh, that, that were in any way, you know, uh, meaningful assets in the space from an information perspective. 
And so I did, a, and whenever I talked to one of these few big companies, I said, look, you know, I'll need a number that begins with a three. In other words, it's got to be more than 30 million pounds. You know, I'd raised 4 million. So that's a big number. And, um, and they all told me I was completely mad. And I said, no, I'm not mad. This is just too early. It's very simple. And after the, when the, when the, um, the great financial crisis hit 2008, first of all, we were a bit like, um, yeah, who's the actor in, in I'm, I'm trying to think in, um, well, we're like in one of these films where, you know, somebody has shot at the hero and then the hero doesn't know if it's been hit and has to check. And I'm thinking of uh, the one with John Travolta and uh, oh, you know, this I'm going to sound like a real idiot on your podcast here because I can't remember the name of the film. Um, <laughs> well, at least we get to know who your favorite actors are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but my favorite, I'm, I'm blanking on his name. Anyway, never mind. You know, it was like, the, the, so the great financial crisis hit and you don't know if you've been, you know, hit or hurt. Nobody knew. Nobody knew what was happening. And then slowly we worked out that actually, you know, w w there was a big wobble, but we got through it. We raised a bit of money and we, and we all hit the phones doing uh, debt collection and that was fine. We survived. And these big information companies, they also didn't know because they were selling to the, you know, the financial sector. And, um, and then one of them called and said, okay, we, uh, you know, we, we know we're fine. Um, but we're probably not going to be growing, but your sector looks good. So we want to actually bid for you. And we think we can meet the requirement, the, the number beginning with three. And uh, I'm not going to say who it was, but uh, that was very exciting. I said, okay, I can take that to the board. They then, I don't, am I allowed to use the word assholes? Sure. They behave like assholes. They, they behave like assholes afterwards. Yeah. They basically thought that they had the deal done and they moved on and they treated me you know, very poorly for a, a month or two. And I said, look, the hell with this. I'm going to, I'm going to bring in a bank and we're going to do an auction. Okay. You know, the team is being destabilized. They know that we're, yeah. that we're uh, selling. Um, and, um, and, and so we've got to go through with this, but we need help. And I brought in a bank and we then ran an auction process. And actually it was um, the, the, the people who are behaving badly. They, they went kind of ballistic at this. They thought they had the deal all wrapped up and they never had. Uh, and so we went into a very, very professional, well-run process and, uh, and you know what, we, in terms of the owner, we nailed it. You could yeah. not imagine now, again, looking back, yeah. Steve Jobs joining the dots back. Yeah. I cannot imagine Better. what it would be yeah. like had we had sold, had we sold it to that initial bidder or to any of the other companies in that process, you know, it has been just fantastic to the point where unbelievably I'm still writing. I'm still a contributor, you know, a senior, uh, senior yeah, contributor you're obsessed. To, yeah. you know, and, and this is like, what is it? 12 years yeah. from when I sold it. Yeah. And I still, I still love the business. I still love the people. That's I still incredible. think that it is entirely on message in terms of supporting the transition. Yeah. Uh, it's done unbelievably great work. And, and the other players, I mean, who is the number two to Bloomberg NEF? Right. I don't I even know. know. I don't yeah. even know who you'd say, you know? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Right, yeah, listen, that's amazing. Okay. So this is a perfect segue into what you're doing now because, you know, clearly you love the sector. You love the sector. So what, so what's, what's the next chapter in your life? Well, so I, you know, it, it's, I don't know if I love the sector. I just, I think that you kind of, I've got to the point where um, I find it very, you know, I, first of all, I'm very much across um, climate change as a real thing. Um, is it as urgent as Extinction Rebellion and Greta Thunberg, you know, would like us believe, you know, do the, is it going to be society, does it threaten societal collapse in a decade or two? No. I mean, that's just, you know, th th there are all sorts of um, scenarios spun by all sorts of interested parties, um, but it is happening and it is existential in the longer term. So we have a responsibility. We are the generation that has a responsibility to deal with it. And I do also see the solutions. And I think I have got the privilege from where I sit. I can see them perhaps, you know, in a bit, you know, in three in 3D, you know, quite well. So I've got, I, you know, I've got a kind of, on the one hand, I, uh, I, I guess I, what I'm saying is I'd find it very difficult if you said to me, I've got this fantastic opportunity in computer games or, you know, something, I, I don't think I'd be able to focus. It just doesn't feel important enough. Right, right. Maybe medical science feels important enough, but I have absolutely no window into that. No knowledge. Yeah, energy so, touches everyone. So, yeah. 
Yeah, it, it, exactly. So, um, so it's, it feels important and I feel like I've got a good, you know, vantage point. And so I, this is what I'm going to do the rest of my career. I have some advisory roles. Um, so I'm, I'm on the advisory board for Equinor, the, um, the Norwegian energy company, uh, formerly Statoil, but now a broad energy company, one of the leaders in offshore wind in the world. A huge um, company. This is no small company. No, a huge company uh, and, and a really cool company to work with, I will say, you know, because they, they, they are, they're so deeply committed to, you know, their business and to doing things right. It's a pleasure to work with them. Um, it, and I also advise a bank called SDCL, Sustainable Development Capital, which is one of the world's biggest investors in energy efficiency and uh, a company that I think you're going to be hearing a lot about. And, uh, you know, you, you maybe should get the CEO, John Redfern, on here. Um, which is ever, and that's closed loop geothermal. You know, geothermal is the dog that's never barked from the per from the perspective of the of the transition. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. And I think that ever has a good chance of having ticked the you know all of, of those reasons off. So I, I work with them. Okay, great. Um, yeah, we'd love to we'd love to get in touch with them. When you say closed loop geothermal, at what scale is this? Home scale, industrial scale? No, no. This is this is this is uh, high enthalpy. This is deep. This is drilling down. You know, uh, three, four, five. Uh, you know, three, three, four kilometers deep, um, and generating electricity or industrial scale heat. Uh, it's it's big scale, very scalable. Um, you know, with the right tailwind on drilling costs, this could be the third leg of the stool after wind and solar in terms of modern renewables. You know, obviously, you have, so if you have hydro, wind, solar, and closed loop geothermal, that could get you very deep decarbonization in most uh, energy markets of the world. Can I ask you a um, question on that? If, if it's something like geothermal, which could be base load, and if it's the super deep stuff, which means you do it everywhere, what is your like intersection lens into the future say about why not just that? Why would you need solar and wind if you had a uh, oh. if you had a base load uh, that you could put anywhere? So I I think and you know you you should uh, you should definitely quiz uh, John Redfern on this. I think it's going to be more expensive than wind and solar. You know that we're getting we're going to be it. we're looking at ten dollars a megawatt hour in a good location for wind and solar. So the challenge becomes do as much of that as you can integrate and use, but you still need to keep the lights on when it's not windy and it's not sunny. And batteries uh, are fine for overnight. They may be fine for two days, but they're going to get really expensive when you go out, when you push out longer than that. And, then what and so you want to put it to, you're going to have to create a portfolio. There's no question. And where do you see nuclear fitting into the mix? Well, because, yeah. I, I, so I think that, that um, ever in a way competes with nuclear because it is that kind of, you know, dispatch where it likes to run alone. You can load follow, but you can only load follow, you know, so far. But, uh, but so, I, I you're, you're, yeah, so your criticism against the geothermal, though, was simply a cost one. What I'm often confused by is in the nuclear sector, it has it had the reverse learning curve. If you just rewind right. back to the 60s, it was it was as yeah. cheap as the cheapest solar and wind is today. Right. So, by the way, you know, geothermal, traditional geothermal has other strikes against it. You can only do it in certain places. And then, of course, there's a lot of talk about enhanced uh, geothermal, which is fracking. And then you've got all of the issues, not just of, of um, social acceptance, but also of risk. As soon as you have risk in a project, your cost of capital is going yeah, up. Yeah, and as soon as that happens, you're in a different cost point. The nice thing about uh, about Ever and Closed Loop is it's a manufacturing process. It's just how how far how fast can you drill and can you get those drilling costs down and if you can then you can hit you know ultimately whatever cost point you you know you want if you're prepared to do enough of it. Uh, nuclear had a different issue, the reverse learning curve. Largely, um, you know, I I think it's to be quite honest, I think it's wrong to say it has inherently got a reverse learning curve. I because, agree. I agree. You know, th that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, exactly. You still exactly. have learning. And the, the problem is, if you're building one of these huge, you know, uh, Olkiluoto, Vopel, um, uh, Hinkley C, Flamanville, those nuclear power stations, how many are you going to build in your career? Three? Right. Five? You know, and, and so it's very difficult to, to, to encapsulate learning. And of course, what happened also is that nuclear then had uh, a, a real escalator in terms of the safety requirements for obvious reasons. Um, but, you know, you've gotten to the point where, you know, it's a bit like the, the, the $800 hammer from NASA, where 
there's no it's just expensive because it's expensive um you know there are there's regulation around um pressure vessels that even apply to technologies of nuclear you know new nuclear technologies that don't have pressure vessels you know it's just become ridiculous and it needs to be needs to be straightened out i mean on nuclear i'm a i'm a big fan of keeping existing nuclear running and trying to do uh you know small modular a, a, a nuclear technology that is number one walk away safe walk away safe means something bad happens you don't need the you know the the generators to keep running or whatever it is safe um even with no human intervention uh and and then also modular and smaller so that you can really you know maybe make it in a shipyard and then you can you can capture learning uh, over time yeah, um, i think your insight is dead on i mean it seems like a lot of the problems can be solved just by making it smaller you can have a reduced, you know, risk envelope. You can, and you can uh, capture those learning curves um, and make it more of a manufactured product, you know, just by making it smaller, even without any like crazy breakthrough in technology. Right, and you know, it would parallel, I think, in some industries like the steel industry. You know, huge vast mills, steel yeah, plants. Yeah. You know, they, they kind of, you know, disappeared up their own complexities, yeah. and then you had mini mills, and suddenly, you know, the industry could be more flexible and make higher quality products. There, yeah, there classic, are industry uh, Clayton yeah. Christensen, yeah, right. But then you get other industries where scale is the only thing. So if you want to, if you want to be running, you know, container ships, just bigger is cheaper, and it's yeah, as simple yeah. as that. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so just coming back to the other things that I'm doing, I do, um, I, I do still, I write for Bloomberg. I also, uh, amazingly enough, they don't tell you this in your uh, school careers, uh, your school careers officers don't tell you that actually um, being a paid speaker is a thing. And so, you know, and so in a way, I'm in the entertainment industry a little bit, you know, and I, and I go around and I keynote uh, conferences and I didn't know I, that my audience just got you for free. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this was a, this was a promotional item. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but, and then now, but what I am also doing, I do some angel investing and I've just set up a platform called Eco Pragma Capital with a business school buddy and another uh, another friend who's a, a, a financial maven. And what we're trying to do with Eco Pragma Capital is just put more structure around. I see so many opportunities. I have never seen so many investment opportunities. And they come to me, you know, on a daily basis. And it's everything from the magic molecule to the, the magic way of making steel uh, or, or hydrogen, not using electrolysis, but using, you know, uh, photocatalysis, all the way up to two gigawatts of solar in Greece or two gigawatts of electrolysis in Western Australia. And I see this fire hose of opportunities. And I talk to all these investors, but I don't have a platform to structure, you know, to, to, to map A onto B. And so that's what we're doing. And, uh, you know, we, we've, we've, we've just sort of gotten started and, uh, and testing and the a few pragma, hypotheses. The pragma and Ica pragma, is that pragmatic? Is that the pragmatic? Idea? Yes. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. I loved yeah. it already. I love yeah. it. There's just too much. Like I say, I, I don't, I don't build tissues of things. I'm yeah, interested yeah, yeah. in pragmatism. We've got to get this job done in terms of the climate and in terms of, you know, and it's not just that there's air, there's all sorts of reasons to love this stuff, air quality, yeah, and, and energy just, poverty. Yeah. 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 They're just more elegant solutions. It's as simple as that. They are more elegant solutions. But if you start being, you know, uh, ideological about, uh, uh, about, you know, whatever it is, then you're lost. And so eco, yes, we've got to solve these problems. But pragma, we're going to do it, you know, using, um, you know, methodologies familiar to the capital markets in ways that don't break the laws of physics, like some of these, you know, uh, flying aircraft things, you know, fly, you know we, we've got a whole bunch of stuff that's going to come, come down with a bump in the next few years in terms, you know, there's a bunch of SPACs that are based on things that just break the laws of physics. <laughs> so that's not pragma. <laughs> um, and then, so what form is this taking place? Is it an advisory, a fund, consultancy? What so is we, eco pragma? We're going to, we're going to start, you know, we kind of have to start with advisory because none of us, uh, we, the three of us have never, we are not a proven team. You know, if, we, if we'd spun out of a VC, we'd be able to just raise money quite easily, I think, with our, our, our capabilities. So we've got the skills, but we don't have that kind of, you know, uh, if, you, if you're a, um, uh, you know, fund placement agency, all they do is they go down, they check the box. Has this team worked together? What is its record? You know, and so on. And we, we can't tick those. Um, so we're talking to a few platforms that we might work with to join forces. 
uh, and a few family offices that might anchor us and give us a, you know, a blind pool to invest. But the most likely is we're just going to get started and we're just going to do stuff. And if we do smart stuff, good things will happen. Yeah, kind of like earlier in your career with uh, New Energy Finance. Amazing. Yeah, you, you've got to get started. Three times in my life, I've just gonna left a job not knowing what I'm going to do. And just things have been value. okay. Just and create you, value. You, you, you just create value. Good things will happen. Uh, but it's scary as anything. This is less scary because we're all experienced and, you know, got a bit, bit more of a buffer here. But, uh, but, but that's what we're doing. Um, Michael, this has been an amazing conversation. I feel like I could talk to you for hours on any one of these topics that we just barely graced the surface on. So I hope we can continue it into the future. Uh, is there any final notes you'd like to leave our audience on or any way that they can find you or, or uh, you know, I know you got a podcast. Should we talk about that for a second? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah uh, we've got to talk about that because I need to give a plug. You know, I'm coming. This is my promotional thing. And I'm not even promoting what I'm supposed to be promoting. Um, <laughs> I remembered. So, I remembered that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I have a uh, I have a podcast called Cleaning Up, which is my lockdown project. Actually, I've got a few lockdown projects, but that's one of them. Um, and I, it is really just um, me talking to people, these extraordinary leaders that I've met and interacted with during the last you know nearly twenty years now. And it's been just a, an incredible cast. So you know, you had uh, your opening episode was Stephen Chu. So he yeah. graced me with a with a really nice session on cleaning up. I also had Ernie Moniz. I got the first conversation with Ernie Moniz after the Biden election, uh, when he was actually still in the frame for potential Secretary of Energy again, uh, which didn't happen. But I got it. I talked to him about Iran, all sorts. Uh, I had. Um, uh, uh, Christiana Figueres, who headed up the UNFCCC for the Paris Agreements. Uh, actually, I've had I've interviewed four or five people who were key players in the Paris Agreement. Um, so most recently, it's just about to come out. Todd Stern, the U.S. negotiator, uh, but also Laurence Tubiana, the French negotiator, Amber Rudd, the British negotiator, and so on. So we got the you know, um, but also uh, then um, Tony Blair. Uh, had a session with Tony Blair and Tony Abbott, the Australian prime minister who actually got rid of the carbon tax in Australia and set back carbon, uh, climate action by a few years there. Uh, and, um, and is now, I'm on the UK board of trade. I'm an advisor to the board of trade with Tony Abbott. And so we talked about all of these green trends and, uh, and I think it's a fascinating conversation. So cleaning up. And when you ask, how can people find me? That's the wrong question, Brett. Okay. The question, to be honest, is how do people? How can people possibly avoid me? Because I'm <laughs> out there in so many different platforms. Yeah, that's great. Okay, well, yeah, we'll we'll come up with a better question. Maybe how people can help you, or how you can help people. I'm sure either either will work. Um, Very good. And, and look, you know, the easiest way to find me is probably on Twitter, where I got a big mouth and I get into all sorts yeah, of fights. I love it. Love it. Okay, awesome, Michael Liebrick. Thank you again. Uh, it's been awesome. Brett, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Our leadership in science and industry, our hopes for peace and security, our obligations to ourselves as well as others, all require us to make this effort to solve these mysteries, to solve them for the good of all men and for the progress of all people.